Welcome to the Jewish Policy Center webinar series. I'm Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. I hope you're not snowed in, but for those of you who are, I can only say we are about two weeks from pitchers and catchers reporting for spring training. And that I think is a better sign of spring than Punxsutawney Phil who said six more weeks of winter yesterday. As many of you know, this, uh, and there are a great many of you out there today, the JPC is a 501c3 nonprofit organization providing analysis of foreign policy and domestic policy by leading scholars, academics, and commentators. Um, you can find our work, our inside articles, our magazine in focus quarterly, and our blogs on the website at www.jewishpolicycenter.org. As institutions and as individuals, the JPC supports a strong American defense capability, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. Uh, we support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny those things. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, uh, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, and free speech and intellectual diversity. Those last two are giving us a little bit of angst these days. Uh, our guest today, Richard Goldberg from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, was actually our first webinar guest last March. And I know it's a long time ago. Uh, since that time, we've had a lot of interesting speakers and we've covered a lot of territory. Uh, we had Brigadier General Asaf Orion of the IDF talk about the US-Israel security relationship and the relationship of both countries with China. Israeli diplomatic correspondent David Weinberg on the Abraham Accords and his visit to the UAE in December. Award-winning journalist Claudia Rosette on the Hong Kong uprising, Dan Blumenthal on China, Harold Rode on Turkey's desire to Islamize Jerusalem, uh, Ilya Shapiro, Jonathan Shanzer, Doug Fife, Michael Duran, and Michael Preachant, who talked to us about long wars and why America has them. Rich Goldberg, our guest today, is uh, going to follow up on things I think that he said to us in March. Rich is the senior advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies after serving as director for countering Iranian weapons <clears throat> of mass destruction at the White House NSC. I tried to make an acronym out of director for countering Iranian weapons of mass destruction. Didn't work. He was the leading architect of the maximum sanctions campaign against Iran targeting the central bank, <clears throat> the swift financial messaging service and sectors of the Iranian economy. Prior to that, as a member of Senator Mark Kirk's staff, he drafted and negotiated legislation promoting human rights and democracy in Iran, including sanctions targeting entities that provide the regime with tools of oppression. Uh, to stay up to date on Iran, on sanctions, on what's happening inside the country, Follow Rich on Twitter, he's really great. I don't usually recommend that people follow people on Twitter, but Rich is really great on Twitter. Uh, he is at Rich underscore Goldberg. Again, that's at Rich underscore Goldberg. And now your public service announcement from the JPC, you are muted, you know that. Um, but you can send questions, not to our info address anymore. We used to take questions on info, we now take questions only on the Q&A function on your Zoom. So we're monitoring during the program. Please let us know what you're thinking. And Rich Goldberg, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and it's great to be back. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe we're, we're still in this virtual environment, uh, but, but uh, glad to be beamed uh, back to all of you at, at your lunch hour or, or whatever you're doing, digging out from the snow where you are. Uh, yes, it, it has been a while since we were last together last March, uh, and the maximum pressure campaign only continued to increase uh, throughout those months, all the way to the very last day of the Trump administration. And today uh, remains in effect, at least on paper. Uh, obviously, the Iranians will begin uh, testing uh, the enforcement of those sanctions. We're already seeing reports of that uh, in the oil sector and some of the tankers that are moving some supplies. Uh, we'll see that more as well. We saw Iran take a South Korean tanker in the Gulf, uh, trying to see if they can't get some of the money uh, that has been frozen due to sanctions, particularly terrorism sanctions, unfrozen. We're seeing some troubling reports today on that. We'll, we'll talk about that. But I want to step back a little bit and think about where we are today and where, where we might be going under the Biden administration. 
Uh, right now, we have the stated policy uh, of President Biden and Secretary Blinken and his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, that the United States wants to rejoin the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran deal as it's formerly known, uh, as long as Iran comes back into full compliance or strict compliance, they've used both terms. Now, it's an interesting formulation. Uh, first of all, they're saying that Iran must take the first step that they must come into strict compliance with the old 2015 deal. Uh, and then the United States would come into full compliance as well, which would mean lifting uh, of a, a wide range of sanctions if indeed they were to the letter of the JCPOA. Now, why is that problematic here in 2021? Well, even those who supported the Iran nuclear deal back in 2015 admitted up front that the deal started in perhaps the West's favor on a short-term basis for the first five years. But everything after the first five years was all in Iran's favor, which is why critics said we shouldn't do this deal. It didn't make any sense to give up all the sanctions relief for something that would start being in Iran's favor after five years and would lead to legitimate pathways, potentially to nuclear weapons and certainly to large conventional arms stockpiles. What did we see last fall in October? The arms embargo uh, under the resolution uh, that governs uh, the Iran deal, 2231, uh, having the Iran arms embargo expire on Iran, missile restrictions uh, coming next in 2023, a range of centrifuge and enrichment restrictions thereafter, all the way to 2031. And all the meanwhile, Iran would reap all of the economic benefits of the deal, testing and improving on their ballistic and cruise missile capabilities, uh, being able to expand uh, their terror activities, uh, fund terrorist groups and militias throughout the Middle East to get strongholds, that Shia crescent that we talk about from Yemen all the way back around to the Mediterranean and Lebanon. And so this was obviously the reason we did not like the deal back in 2015 for those of us who were critics of it and why we supported President Trump's decision to leave the deal. Going back into the deal in 2021 makes very little sense. It would accept the fact that the first sunset has already come and gone in 2020. Remember, the Trump administration implemented what they said was a snapback of the UN Security Council resolution. It's a big food fight at the Security Council. The Trump policy was that they had snapbacks, that they would not recognize the lifting of the arms embargo, they imposed an executive order to issue sanctions against Russia and China if they tried to transfer arms to Iran. And those would cover also missile uh, transfers in 2023 as well. Uh, if we go back into a deal that's already expiring, that's in Iran's favor in 2021, even from proponents' views back in 2015, that makes very little sense to give up all your leverage up front to go back into an expiring deal that's in Iran's favor. Why ever would Iran want to negotiate from there? The second piece of that is that leverage piece. You know, President Obama himself had credited our sanctions in Congress, the Kirkman-Endez sanctions, as they were called, the central bank sanctions of 2011 and the follow-on sanctions that we pushed to disconnect Iranian banks from SWIFT and sanction entire sectors of Iran's economy, with Iran coming to the table to begin with in 2013 to negotiate what would later be the JCPOA. Now, they made a lot of mistakes in that bargain. They gave up leverage up front in the interim deal, as you may recall. We granted sanctions relief before we got a deal and therefore got a pretty bad deal, and we caved on a lot of red lines. But he admitted that they would never have come to the, to the table in the first place if it wasn't for our sanctions pressure. So the question then, of course, is how could President Biden, as he has stated, achieve an even better deal where he extends the sunsets, he covers missiles, he covers other concerns like terrorism, but loses all the leverage that even President Obama had in the first place, goes back to square one with no sanctions in place. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, what the Biden administration will say is that they have leverage that they've learned a lesson, that, that it turns out that people like me were right. The US could reimpose the sanctions that we had on Iran unilaterally without European support, without China and Russia support. And the way our financial sanctions work, they all have to comply. And so the Iranians know we could do this again. We could you know, not snap back at the UN, but we could snap back unilaterally our sanctions uh, and that they would suffer the economic consequences of it like they did in 2018. Now, the problem with that argument is it's hard to find that to be a credible threat. Why does the Biden administration today say it's so urgent to go back into the deal? Because Iran right now is raising the stakes. They're trying to create political pressure 
They're trying to create their own leverage. They're enriching uranium, installing new centrifuges, installing new cascades. We just saw an announcement in the last 24 hours of another set of cascades going in to the Fordo facility underground this time. And so, you know, what one of the uh, questions that uh, that we have to uh, ask is, if the Biden administration is willing to give up all of our sanctions leverage because they're afraid of Iran's enrichment, what do you think Iran will do next time if they have still kept all their enrichment capabilities intact? And the Biden administration says, if you don't negotiate a better deal, we're going to reimpose all the sanctions. Well, of course, they would threaten to resume all their enrichment that scared them off in the first place. So it doesn't seem very credible that you would ever reimpose the sanctions if the Iranian response is something you're too afraid of. And so that brings us to a couple other things that have changed. Even if you accept their leverage argument that they, that they would reimpose the sanctions, even if you accept their argument that yes, it's an expiring deal, it's five years old, but you know the arms embargo, yeah, it expired, but we can try to use our diplomacy and our sanctions to stop arms. And yes, the missile restrictions are bad, but we'll use our sanctions and diplomacy to try to stop that. The really bad sunsets don't really start till 2025 on the nuclear program. So we have the entirety of a, a Biden term uh, to, to achieve another, another uh, deal. Well, there's two more problems that they have. Number one, what has changed in the last four years? Number one, because the Trump administration in its first year and a half was focused on a counter IRGC as the Revolutionary Guard Corps, a counter IRGC strategy in Iran while remaining in the Iran deal. Remember, Trump didn't get out of the Iran deal day one. It wasn't four years of maximum pressure. If anything, it was maybe a year and a half of maximum pressure. Uh, it took them a while to get rid of waivers even after they got out of the deal. But in 2017, we were in the deal. We were pursuing what was called a counter IRGC strategy. So suddenly all the bells and whistles of the intelligence community and treasury and state looked like never before at companies and banks and everybody who might have tentacles connected to the IRGC. And so what we see today is that the Central Bank of Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company, its tanker company, its chemical company, more than 300 entities, six sectors of Iran's economy, all with recent documented evidence from the Treasury Department, the Department of Justice, the State Department corroborating that these entities and sectors are tied to terrorism, not to the nuclear program, they're tied to the IRGC. We also saw that while we were in the JCPOA in 2017, Congress, Bob Menendez, now the chairman of foreign relations, along with then chairman Bob Corker, joined together with a counter IRGC sanctions bill passed into law as part of the larger CATSA legislation that most people think about as Russia sanctions. But actually the first big piece is Iran sanctions targeting the IRGC, passed almost unanimously in both chambers of Congress. What can pass almost unanimously today in these partisan times? But sanctions on the IRGC and Iranian terrorism do. So if you're the Biden administration now and you're saying we'll go back into the Iran deal if Iran comes to strict compliance, what does that mean in terms of offering terrorism sanctions relief? You've also promised that you will continue terrorism sanctions. The Central Bank of Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company, all these entities and sectors, they were promised sanctions relief under the deal, under the banner of nuclear sanctions relief. Now we know they're all terrorism sanctions and they're designated as such under US law. Are they gonna give sanctions relief to these entities even though they're tied to the IRGC? Can they do that? A lot of trickiness. What will Congress say about that? Should they legislate in advance to ensure that they can't? There's some questions we can explore. The last piece is strict compliance with the deal. Even if you accept the fact that somehow you're gonna get around the terrorism sanctions piece, that you're gonna get around the fact that this is an expiring deal and you think you have some sort of leverage and you just stick to the you know, four corners of the Biden administration policy, if we will come into full compliance, if Iran comes into full compliance, what does full compliance mean four years later? What has happened in the last four years? Well, let's think about this. In 2018, Mossad brought out of Iran a secret nuclear weapons archive. They had archived all their work on nuclear weapons, kept it curated. Who knows what else they have curated, waiting for a time to perhaps resume work on nuclear weapons directly. What we also know is that the head of their nuclear weapons program in the past, the Ahmad plan, 
Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, who you may remember was assassinated just a couple months ago, was in charge of a secret military organization called SPND that was employing nuclear weapon scientists. Today, they are working at a military organization, same people who have now been unmasked and identified by the Treasury Department back in 2018, who were working on nuclear weapons previously. That's a big deal. So they have an archive, they have a secret organization, it's employing nuclear weapon scientists. What are they doing there? Oh, and then in the last year, we find out from Vienna, from the International Atomic Energy Agency, likely based on work that they did uh, using some of the information provided in the public domain from the nuclear archive, there's undeclared nuclear material in Iran. There's undeclared nuclear activities going on, undeclared sites, some of which Iran wouldn't even let them into last year, according to press reports. Do we know where the material is? Do we know what these sites were? Iran says the archive is fabricated. They won't answer any questions. So the question then is, if the JCPOA was premised on Iran abandoning its nuclear ambitions and promising never to develop nuclear weapons in the future, and they were required to fully account for all their past work on nuclear weapons in advance of sanctions relief, that was the key prerequisite, how could they come into full or strict compliance with the JCPOA today while ignoring all of these new questions about the archive, SPND, and undeclared nuclear materials, activities, and sites? They can't unless you decide to turn a blind eye. So a lot of questions there for the Biden administration to conquer. I think there are some bipartisan ways forward. We can talk about those, but that's the scene setter right now is Iran, as we see in the news, ratcheting up the pressure, trying to create the political context to let the Biden administration say, we have a crisis, we need to go back into the deal. And of course, there is an alternative to going back into a bad deal. There's also working with your allies, working with the Israelis and the Arabs. Remember, we have an Abraham Accords now. We have a joint voice in the Middle East outside of Iran that says, don't go back into this deal. And you can build a coalition of pressure like we once had. Go to the UN, complete the snapback with our European allies so everyone agrees that it's happened. Ensure Tehran knows that there is a credible military threat on the table if they pass red lines on their nuclear program. Impose the sanctions together and have clear guidelines of what it will take to normalize relations with the West. We could choose that path or we can sort of go back to where we were in 2015, act like the world hasn't changed since then. Unfortunately, that's a pathway for Iran to reap enormous economic benefit, build up hegemony throughout the Middle East, and eventually develop nuclear weapons. Rich, thank you. Um, we have a number of questions. And let's go to a couple of them. Um, several people want you to talk about bipartisan ways forward. So hang on to that thought. And with that thought comes the question from a listener, uh, should the JCPOA have been treated like a treaty um, in 2015? Did Congress make a mistake by allowing the Obama administration to say, it's not really a treaty, you don't have to pass it, you can just, because that was also a bipartisan sentiment on the Hill that there was something wrong with the JCPOA. So two things, should it have been treated like a treaty? And what's a bipartisan way forward? Yeah, so both great questions. And also, let me just correct myself. I think I said Fordo back when talking about a, a new, new Cascades were being installed. I meant to say the Natanz facility uh, that now has an underground component uh, after uh, some mysterious explosions last year. Uh, but uh, on the question of a treaty for the JCPOA, um, that is not Congress's fault or mistake, I would say. Obviously, Congress can't decide what is a treaty. Uh, the executive uh, has to negotiate a treaty and submit it to the United States Senate. The way that the JCPOA was negotiated intentionally from a legal perspective was to ensure it was not a treaty and therefore not uh, needed to be uh, submitted uh, to the U.S. Senate. Now, even though Iran made a big deal of submitting it uh, to its parliament, uh, you know that that's sort of their show. It could easily have been a treaty, uh, would not have been hard to make that a treaty, um, but they decided not to in the Obama administration because they knew it could not get the requisite votes to pass. And we saw that even with the very weak watered down uh, compliance uh, confirmation uh, legislation in NARA, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, uh, 
that Congress had decided to pass, which put the onus on Congress to reject rather than uh, put the onus on the administration uh, to get it approved by Congress. So that was a mistake of legislation uh, that Congress made. But I believe it was the only thing the Democrats would agree to at the time, unfortunately. Um, but even then, we saw, at least in the cloture vote in the Senate, uh, that it was obvious that they would not have been able to pass a treaty through the Senate. Now, they should have known as negotiators that that's actually a help to them, that they'll be able to go back to the table and say, I'm sorry, we do not have 67 votes for this. It's not going to happen. Uh, you need to give us the following conditions. And they should have brought senators from both parties to the table or at least to the sidelines to be participants and observers which is actually something from history when we have negotiated arms control treaties, uh, something that the Senate has had a role in doing to ensure that you do get good negotiations, you do get good agreements that can uh, be ratified by the US Senate. They didn't do that purposefully. It wasn't even a signed executive agreement um, like we had with Poland or the Czech Republic to put missile defense there, which of course was ripped up the moment the Obama administration came in in 2009 switching over from, from the Bush administration. It was simply a political statement. A, a, uh, that's why it's called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It's a plan of action. It has very legal, very, very little legal um, validity to it. The Security Council resolution Iran would say gives it some sort of international legal binding nature. However, the Security Council resolution we talked about last March uh, does not actually mandate the JCPOA. It simply encourages parties uh, to participate in it. On the question of bipartisan ways forward, I think that is the key question here. We saw, I think, 150 House Democrats send a letter uh, to the Biden administration during transition uh, saying, please go back into the nuclear deal if Iran comes back into compliance. It was literally written word for word, you know, based on what the Biden team's uh, own sort of statements had been to date. So I'm sure that was in close coordination. Uh, there are partisan Republican letters going around, you know, quite with the opposite message of don't go back into the deal. Uh, and so, it, you know, there is a danger here of it simply being, you know, this partisan uh, talking point where, where it's, uh, if you're a Republican, you're against it, you're a Democrat, you have to be for it. I think that's a mistake. Uh, it, it totally discounts the way this issue was for so many years by partisans on the Hill and the number of Democratic allies um, that, uh, that are quite hawkish uh, when it comes to Iran, particularly on issues that impact uh, the US uh, national security most directly, um, issues uh, like terrorism, where people have in their districts and states victims of Iranian terrorism, whether it's the Beirut families, Kobar families, uh, U.S. soldiers' families who were killed by the IRGC in Iraq. Um, there's a lot of districts out there uh, that remember and have, you know, the real emotional impact of Iranian terrorism, and that resonates with a lot of senators on both sides of the aisle and in, in the House as well. Human rights is an issue uh, that has united Congress in the past and has been a core issue in the Democratic Party for many years. Uh, the issue of U.S. hostages that are still being held by Iran, again cross you know, party lines. It may be that the politics of the JCPOA itself and the nuclear uh, accord, how to deal with Iran's nuclear program has become this poll tested message that Democrats fear their base for uh, and, and you can't get agreement on whether to go back in or not. But you can go below the surface there and reinterpret the meaning of the deal and our rights under the deal. Remember the Obama administration promised us that under the JCPOA, the US was allowed to impose sanctions for non-nuclear reasons, terrorism, human rights, missiles, hostages, whatever else. We have done so over the last four years. And so we have all of the sanctions framework for terrorism, for human rights, for missiles. What we could have, uh, if we can get it, is bipartisan support to say to the Biden administration, you know, you may say you're going back into the nuclear deal, and that may be what you say for messaging, and people can sign a letter saying you should go back into the nuclear deal, whatever that means for messaging. But when it comes to the actual details, all of the sanctions that are currently designated for non-nuclear reasons, we don't care if they were promised sanctions relief under the nuclear deal originally. It's our right under the nuclear deal to have those sanctions in place. So we do not believe you should grant any sanctions relief whatsoever that benefits any one of those entities, the central bank, the oil company, the oil sector, the petrochemical sector, 
the metal sector, the mining sector, the list goes on and on. Iran's not going to like that. They want that sanctions relief up front and center. Zarif in his, in his statement, his uh, interview with Christian Amman for this week, made it very clear. They want banking, oil, and transportation sanctions lifted now. Well, guess what? The Central Bank of Iran, the National Iranian Oil Company, and the Ra National Iranian Tanker Company are all designated for terrorism. We have proof that they are funding the IRGC directly. So it's very easy for Congress to come together and say, well, we may disagree on the JCPOA, whatever that means, but we agree that we have to keep terrorism sanctions in place. We can also say not a dime can go to Iran so long as they hold all U.S. hostages, any U.S. hostage. Uh, these are things where you could have bipartisan agreement on. And, you know, in the technical implementation, it really doesn't mean you're in the old deal. It means you're in a different state. Okay. Um, question. It doesn't seem that Iran sanctions have actually been all that effective because the Iranians are still doing all the things that we didn't want them to do. Terrorism and nukes and missiles and all of that. How effective are sanctions? And... I think that's the end of the question. How effective are sanctions? Yeah, they're, they're actually very effective. Um, this is an unprecedented level of sanctions that we have leveled on a country and on a banking sector and, and you know, tried to really clamp down as much as possible. There is some illicit trade that goes on uh, to, to keep them afloat barely, uh, particularly with China. Uh, but in general, uh, they are, you know, think of a ship where there's a lot of holes and the water's coming on and the captain's giving an order to keep, you know, bucketing out the water. But for every bucket of water, you're taking three to four buckets on through the holes. And that's sort of what the economy of Iran is today. Uh, we don't know exactly how much time they would have without any sanctions relief if sanctions were continued to be enforced and increased. Uh, but we do know from the IMF, uh, as of last fall, they had less than $9 billion of accessible foreign exchange reserves. All the rest of it was locked up, inaccessible, partially accept, accessible around the world where they can't bring it back to Iran. They can use it for some humanitarian goods, uh, but that's about it. That's not a lot of money uh, for a, a government that also runs subsidy programs, uh, has a, an inpatient population that's already had outbursts of protests, mass protests in the streets. You remember late 2019, uh, after they tried to cut gasoline subsidies because of the sanctions pressure. Uh, massive protests, uh, one of the largest they've seen around the country. They shut down the internet. They deployed to the streets. They, they murdered 1,500 people. Uh, it was really uh, very, very, probably uh, the most surprising and alarming moment for the regime in quite a long time. Now, do they continue sponsoring terrorism? Do they have the capacity to continue enriching uranium? Do they have missile technology to test missiles? They can do all these things. But I will tell you that if you look at their budget for the IRGC and their defense budget for the military and for their proxies, that has continued to go down dramatically. So they have less and less money for those issues. They also have to make decisions. Do they fund the terrorism? Do they fund the missile program? Do they fund the nuclear program? Or does a lot of this money have to get diverted to things like, oh, like the economy and education and healthcare to subsidize uh, what people actually want in Iran, not all these illicit activities. They're always gonna be able to put on a show until you know, it all collapses. Um, but we have to understand that there's a difference between propaganda and sort of a Potemkin village that a regime like this can put on for political warfare versus what they're truly capable of. Now. We all have to have a bottom line. Sanctions alone is not a policy. And that one could argue this was a major criticism of the Trump administration, that it was only willing to use sanctions. Uh, we saw sporadic moments like the Soleimani killing where that was not the case. But overall, you know, one might question whether or not uh, there was uh, other avenues being used. Uh, we did see explosions going on. We know of cyber attacks reportedly. So there were other aspects to the maximum pressure campaign in addition to political warfare uh, that we saw. The Israelis certainly have their military operations ongoing in Syria, uh, perhaps uh, elsewhere as well. And so, uh, yes, uh, you do need to have more than sanctions, uh, but you also have to sort of keep Iran in a box. If they know that going too far on their nuclear program would provoke a military strike, they are not suicidal, at least in my view.
uh, they are going to keep themselves just enough to provoke us, uh, but not incur the military strike. Uh, we've seen them when a red line was drawn of killing Americans and the consequence of Soleimani uh, not go back to that red line. Uh, so if you're not willing to entertain those options, if you're not willing to have a bottom line, then no, it, it likely isn't effective because they know they can basically walk their way to a nuclear weapon uh, or commit a, a heinous uh, terrorism act without a response from the United States. And so I, I hope uh, and would encourage the Biden administration to make very clear statements as we see the nuclear escalation right now. If their only statement is we need to get back to the Iran deal as soon as possible, uh, that's a very weak statement. If they make statements that include, we will never allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons and we will do whatever it takes to ensure that that is the, that that is the outcome. Um, at least they maintain the illusion, if not actually uh, the threat of a credible you know, use of military force as a bottom line, knowing that we don't want that to be what we need to do. We do want to lead with sanctions and diplomacy. Uh, but if they don't know or think that we have a bottom line militarily, then no, it's not, it's not a plausible policy. Thank you. So you mentioned Israel question. Both the Israeli chief of staff and the deputy prime minister um, have said that Israel will not permit Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, the IDF chief of staff general Aviv Kochavi was actually very specific about taking military action. In your view, does Israel have red lines when it comes to uranium enrichment or are they going only in your view to do something about it when there is a bomb or when there is the imminent pres uh, presence of a bomb? So the Israelis have been uh, coy on laying out what a specific red line is. And to be honest, so has the United States. I mean, you recall questions and answers that, that the media was uh, running up a tree on with uh, Secretary Pompeo, I recall asking him, what do you mean that you won't allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon? And he would just say, I mean what I say. And the president would just say, we will never allow Iran to, to have nuclear weapons. But we would never say, you know, if they get to this much enrichment or, you know, these many centrifuges or this site, uh, you know, goes hot, um, that that will be the red line. In some ways, it's good to have a more nebulous uh, set of red lines so that the Iranians uh, have to start wondering um, how far can we go? What is the red line? Um, they go maybe a little slower. If you if you set the red line, they will just go right up to the red line and maybe Put their toe across just to see if that was enough to to actually get something um, and maybe just keep incrementally pushing that red line uh, to see if there's an international response or an israeli response so no we, we don't know exactly what that is uh, we remember the cartoon at the un uh, with the bomb that netanyahu held up uh, prior to the jcpoa um, that was with a literal red line uh, so you know it is good, in my view, that the IDF uh, is making these public statements. That's been missing uh, from the environment for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, if, if the United States is not signaling a willingness to use force as a bottom line, at least the Iranians and Europe and others are hearing the fact that the Israelis are. And I think that there has been something that has changed uh, for this calculus. In the past, when the Israelis have threatened military action, a lot of people have doubted whether or not they could carry that out based on their existing capabilities. Uh, most particularly, they compare it to the OSIRAC uh, strike back in 81 on Iraq. And that was a sort of one and done strike with an above ground facility where you send pilots out uh, with as much fuel as possible. They have one shot, they have to come home and it's possible they don't make it home. Um, Iran is farther, it is more complicated, multiple sites, some underground taking more, you know, much more munitions. Um, and so the question is, with limited air-to-air -air refueling capability and, and such a far distance, could the Israelis ever actually conduct that strike? I do believe the Abraham Accords have to sort of make Iranians wonder, would an airstrip in Saudi Arabia or UAE or Bahrain or elsewhere in the region be used for a hot, what we call hot pitting, where you don't have to refuel in an air, you bring the jets down, refuel on the ground and take off again. Um, could a larger uh, aircraft from another country be in, in, in the wings waiting uh, to be used. Uh, so uh, these are question marks that we don't know the answers to. I, I'm sure the Israelis will never really reveal uh, unless it's to their advantage and some sort of psychological uh, information operation. Uh, 
Um, but you know, the Iranians have to be wondering if, if, if things have changed capability wise and that the Israelis really could make good on a threat, if not to destroy the program, but certainly to delay the program. Um, there was a fatwa against Iranian nuclear weapons um, put out by, they say, by the Ayatollah Khomeini. And a lot of people said, look, you have to believe that he means what he says, okay? He's the leader, he's the boss, he says no. But last week, a former Iranian diplomat, Amir Musavi said, a fatwa is not permanent. Uh, Khamenei may change it. And Okay, so some people didn't believe Khomeini when he said it the first time. But does the fact that an Iranian diplomat would say, no, not permanent, we can change it, it can come and go, what does that do to our thinking? Um, does that make some people feel, is that like a threat? Is that upping the ante? Is that escalation? No, we don't have a permanent fatwa. If for, for anybody who, who believed in the fatwa, uh, you know, please watch the video and, and, and you know, make your mind up based on that. I, I, I can't imagine for, for most rational people that you would have believed the Supreme Leader of Iran that, you know, there's a fatwa, so they're never building nuclear weapons. You know, when Javad Zarif, you know, makes his extortion uh, messages uh, on the current enrichment, you know, he says things like, you know, we, we don't want nuclear weapons, but we can get closer if, if, if we need to. And it's like, well, how could you do that if there's a fatwa against it and, and, you're, and you're not supposed to be building nuclear weapons? What purpose does moving towards weapons grade uranium on your enrichment program serve in the context of not wanting nuclear weapons. Why are you building longer range missiles that are capable of carrying nuclear weapons if you have no interest in nuclear weapons? Uh, so, you know, why do you have a nuclear weapons archive? Why did Mosin for Day still have a job employing at a secret military organization, nuclear weapons scientists? Why are you lying to the IAEA today about nuclear sites and nuclear materials and undeclared activities? You know, none of that makes sense in the context of believing that there is a fatwa against nuclear weapons. What does make sense is that they pick and choose the time. And while they want us to see what we see of their declared activities with the IAEA for their own extortion purposes, we don't know what we don't see. We have hints of it from all these pieces we're putting together over the last four years, but that should be the most worrisome piece. And, and if you are just a rational human being on its face, looking at the evidence, what you would see, and you can believe the IC assessment that Iran is not currently building a nuclear weapon. You can accept that as fact and match that with everything else we've seen from the archive, undeclared materials, SPND, et cetera, and say, yeah, Iran is waiting for the time when the Supreme Leader says, go. And they want all the capabilities. They want the assembly line. They want the longer range missiles. And they want the economy built up to withstand whatever pressure comes when the, when the order you know, comes down. Sorry, I was having a um, microphone issue. So we have, a, um, we have a question here that's a kind of broader question. All this conversation with Iran, it seems to the listener, was not meant to be initially about nuclear weapons, but about bringing Iran back into some rightful place as a regional player, as an international player. And the price of getting back into the system was going to be giving up their nuclear weapons. And so it wasn't really the idea was that Iran wanted to come back into the international civilized world and wanted to be a player and wanted to be an economic power and wanted all these things. And at some point we could get them to give up their nuclear weapons in order to have that. Uh, in your view, is that still a valid view of the Iranian government? Or perhaps there are things they want more than they want to come back into the international um, civilized system. Do they want to be a part of the rest of the world. They want to make money off of the rest of the world while being able to extort the rest of the world. So that, that, that that's basically my thesis of, of this regime. Um, we were definitely sold on the idea uh, by many in the Obama administration that this would be the first step towards normalizing the Islamic Republic of Iran, that we would bring them out of the cold, we would normalize their nuclear program, ensure it's for peaceful purposes only, 
build confidence in, in the international community from inside the regime and allow the moderates inside, you know, the moderates who murder uh, uh, wrestlers, uh, you know, on a daily basis, but the moderates who, who help plan, you know, the explosion of Jewish community centers in Buenos Aires, those kind of moderates, those moderates would finally win out against the hardliners and they would ensure that we could take the next step with the JCPOA too, to start addressing missiles, to start addressing terrorism, uh, et cetera. Obviously this was never gonna happen. Uh, look no further than uh, as Iran was uh, debating legislation uh, during the JCPOA days to address uh, longstanding money laundering concerns and terror finance concerns, they had a piece of legislation that was nearing uh, passage uh, that uh, we were being sold as you read media reports, Iran coming into compliance with international anti-money laundering standards, except there was a loophole in the legislation that was rarely reported. And the loophole was Iran could continue uh, basically funding terrorist organizations. They just don't call them terrorist organizations. Like they call them freedom fighters or you know whoever they are, liberation groups, meaning Hamas, Hezbollah, others that we designate as terrorist organizations. You know they would they would ban all money laundering except for terrorist groups. Uh, so it was a little bit you know ridiculous on its face. The JCPOA was built as a complete gift of everything they ever wanted legitimate pathways to enrichment, industrial size enrichment, legitimate pathways one day potentially uh, for long range uh, missiles, both cruise missiles, ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads, a massive economy with huge trade going on, especially with Europe uh, and with China and Russia, uh, and being able to dig deep and dig in with actual military bases we saw them establishing in Syria uh, and a presence in Yemen with the Houthis and take over Iraq on their border through political means and with militias. And so, no, they, there is no interest in normalizing or being part of the international community as we want to think of it. There is absolutely an idea of making money and having trade to fund all these other illicit malign goals. Okay. Um, final question, and we split it up in different ways because uh, one of the things we've instituted since you were last here is that I try to get my guests to answer a question at the end in a positive way so that we leave on a positive note since this is not a very happy subject. So here's the question. Who are Iran's best allies in its nefarious activities as time goes forward? So it's not only about um, repressing Iran or getting to the nuclear program. There are people who support Iran. Who are Iran's best friends? And here's the happy part. Who are the countries that stick with us uh, the best in all of this? I know the Europeans come along because secondary sanctions and the inability or their desire not to cross us on unilateral sanctions. So who are their best friends? <clears throat> who are our best friends? And what should we be looking at for the future? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because it's a it's a, not a black and white situation in many cases um, for me to say that they have a best friend you know I, I don't know if they really do or not but they have close partners they have you know off and on partners they have um, sort of weird partners which we'll talk about um, and then they have you know true adversaries that, that side with us uh, right now from a financial and economic perspective they are heavily dependent on China uh, China sees them as, you know, one of the stops in their uh, Belt and Road Initiative. They've been uh, putting a lot of money into infrastructure. It's, it's one of the reasons why we think Iran led the world uh, after China uh, with the uh, COVID uh, uh, breakout, uh, perhaps linked uh, to some of the daily flights uh, from Wuhan uh, and other and Gansu and, and elsewhere in China uh, and some of the uh, infrastructure projects that were going on with Chinese labor. Um, Russia obviously is a, a major sponsor uh, and provider of their nuclear program historically at Bushir. Uh, the Russians like making money uh, on their exports. They like uh, showcasing nuclear power plants that they make uh, and uranium that they're exporting. And so Bushir is a project that they really tried to make a flagship uh, worldwide. They want to expand that. They've broken ground on, a, on a, two other sites there at Bushir to build additional power plants currently subject to US sanctions if they move forward any, any further. Uh, 
they also obviously have aims to uh, be arms dealers, both Russia and China. Russia, uh, number one, China, number two. Uh, but there is sort of a list um, that uh, shopping list that Iran has and that the uh, Russians would be more than happy to sell, just as they've done for, for Syria uh, as well. Uh, when we look uh, elsewhere, um, Qatar has, uh, you know, over the course of the last few years, developed uh, one of those weird relationships where they are playing nice uh, with Iran. Uh, you know, there was supposedly this thaw in the GCC recently that was broken at the end of the Trump administration. I haven't seen any change in Qatar's policies on Iran since then very skeptical of that uh, announcement. Uh, Oman has historically also played the role that Switzerland played during World War II uh, in this conflict, uh, where they'll let all sides sort of, you know, use their territory um, to smuggle and, and do whatever and look the other way. Uh, the UAE, uh, while it is an ally in the counter pressure campaign on Iran, um, unfortunately has a lot of problems uh, historically in their port, especially. Uh, which is uh, exploited by Iran and smuggling and, and sanctions evasion campaigns. It's an issue we have to continue to deal with with the Emiratis to crack down on. Uh, Turkey, weird again, off and on relationship. There's a competitive nature, obviously, with Erdogan's own goals. You've heard about uh, Erdogan's Islamic vision for the Middle East, which is separate from Iran's. And then there are some Europeans. Um, the Germans, especially, that really, you know, this is this is what's heartbreaking is the Germans have a close relationship with Israel and pledged to you know, do all they can to prevent another Holocaust. And they have historical reasons for that, obviously. But they have a very close business relationship uh, with Iran. There is a, a Iranian bank uh, in, in uh, Germany that's been used by Hezbollah and others uh, for terror finance, uh, engineering firms uh, selling into their missile program. Uh, they were leading uh, Europe in bilateral trade uh, while sanctions were lifted. So that's problematic. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, we have some allies. The Eastern Europeans uh, stand with the United States and Israel typically uh, against Iran, especially on its missile program. They see that as linked uh, to gaining uh, our support uh, to defend against Russian uh, missile threats. And they see the understanding of, of, of the linkage there. Western Europe, less so. Um, France historically was pretty tough on Iran's nuclear program. That has shifted since the JCPOA. Britain, my gosh, if there is one disappointment in the world for us, it was Britain. The fact that they never went through and supported the snapback even to this day is probably the blackest mark uh, on the Boris Johnson government uh, that there will be. Now, there are good things. We have allies, um, the, the, the rest of the Gulf, uh, is obviously very closely tied now to Israel in a security relationship along with the United States. We have friends in Eastern Europe, as I mentioned. Uh, Japan is a close ally of the United States, even though they will play a role in diplomacy. And even if this administration allows them, they may actually play a role in sanctions relief. Uh, they do see the linkage between their security threats from North Korea uh, and our security threats from Iran. And if you, if you speak to them in that language, Japan can be a, a close ally in this effort. South Korea, depending on the government, uh, obviously, uh, again, linked to their to their uh, North Korea policy as well. Okay, on that note, um, it wasn't exactly uplifting, particularly the part about Great Britain, which is which is very sad for us as Americans. Um, but we'll take it. We're not standing out there by ourselves. We do have friends. Uh, we do have allies. We do have interests and maybe some bipartisan ways to move forward. So I would say um, to everybody as we leave, Rich Goldberg, thank you for a very enlightening presentation. Not as depressing as it could have been. Thank you. <laughs> have a good day. And we will be back with you next week.